Good morning and welcome to our online service at Exmouth Chapel. And we are glad that you're able to join us this morning. And we do hope and we do pray that you will be able to enter into all that we do this morning. Um, enter into the singing, the praying, and especially as we listen to, to God's word. And above all, we want to meet with the risen Lord Jesus this morning. And that is our prayer. We're glad to welcome this morning Ashley Richards. Um, he's preached here before at Exmouth Chapel and we're glad that he's, he's come back. And we're, we'll be looking at a new series this morning. It's all about God's salvation, why we need it, what is involved in it. And, and we'll be answering different questions and we'll be looking at it in Luke chapter 7 and 8, how great a salvation. That, that will take place over the next number of weeks. But this morning, let us begin by hearing from God. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6 says this, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. And in some way that we don't fully understand, we do join the host of heaven in a great cosmic chorus of praise to our God. So let us sing praise to God. Great. 
Let us pray together. Let us pray. O Lord, we approach you as the God who is eternal, infinite and unchanging. The one true God of all the earth. And we do confess that you are king. You're the king of heaven, the king of earth. You're the one who reigns supreme. And you're the God who made us. And you made us your people. And we do praise you and thank you that in and through the Lord Jesus, your son, we know what it is to have sins forgiven. We know what it is to have your provision, your protection. We know what it is that we'll never be cast off. And that your love towards us endures forever. And your faithfulness to all generations. We praise you that you are good. And all that you do is good. And that we can find our satisfaction in you. And so this morning as we meet like this, that, that we would praise you with all of our being. We would give thanks and that we would follow you alone. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. pray together let's pray eternal God and ever blessed father we thank you that we have sung these songs and that we have set our minds upon your steadfast love towards us upon your great salvation found in Jesus Christ and we thank you that in troubled times that during those nights that we can't sleep, that during those anxious times, during times when we're, we're worried that things are overtaking us, that you are a faithful God. And that your love forbids us to think that you would actually abandon us or forsake us. And we thank you that you 
care for us in the huge issues that assail us, but also in the, our tiniest concerns, those concerns that we often feel unworthy to bring before you. And yet you are the God who cares for it all. And we bless you just in, in the same way as a, an eagle cares for her children and sp spreads her wings around her children so you care for us. And so we thank you for your wonderful grace towards us, your wonderful goodness, your compassion, your care, your protection. And we do praise you this morning that you have dealt with the greatest enemy that we face, death itself. We thank you that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And even though we die, we shall live and whoever believes in him will never die. And Father, we are humbled by this and, and we marvel at the vastness of this great truth. And we thank you for it and it is a most precious and abiding truth for us. That we live, we have eternal life. And we thank you that we are part of your church. We thank you by means of telephone calls and cards and emails and, and, and other things that... That, that we can care for one another. Thank you that we can pray for one another. Thank you that we are in a family that we can share our joys, but also those sad times. And Father, we do pray for those who are anxious about the coming week. We pray for those who are concerned, who have big things going on in their lives. And we pray that something of your peace might be their portion. And we pray that in the very depths of their beings that they would, they would have an amazing awareness that you are God and that you're concerned for them. We thank you also that your word continues to go out. And we pray that you would bless the, the efforts of this chapel and our conversations with people day by day. That we would be helped by you to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would introduce them to him. To the one who is the very word of God. And we are amazed that your gospel is going out throughout this nation and throughout this world. That people gather together to praise and worship you, then they scatter to introduce people to the Lord Jesus. So, Father, we do pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, bless conversations where, where Christ is spoken of, that people may come from death to life. And we do think of our nation at this time. We pray for our leadership we pray as they face these peculiar challenges. We pray, O oh God, for protection for our nation with the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we pray for your help, for your care. Thank you that you're sovereign and that your hand is upon us. Father God, we have we led all before you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see. Yet one stands near to thee, my God, he'll show the way to Do not know how many days of life are mine to 
subject of salvation and as you look at salvation over the next uh, few weeks I want to talk this morning about uh, something that is that is key uh, to that element of salvation it's a key element of salvation and that subject is faith how is faith particularly the faith like a centurion as we're going to read from Luke uh, chapter 7 this morning how is that key and how does that fit in with salvation well I'm going to set my stall out very early in that, in that if you do not have faith, then you are missing a key part of salvation. Because you need faith in Christ if you are going to have any form of salvation at all with him. So let's have a little look then as we look at this subject of faith like a centurion and particularly focus on the word faith and focus on that a little bit this morning. So where we thought we were coming to the end of pretty serious uncertainty. And let's be brutally honest, friends, the, the church has been some way scattered, has it not, over the past however many weeks and months. Yeah, okay, you can wave each other at a camera, and you can smile and send texts and an email and write and do whatever you want to do. But there's, there's nothing quite like being together as God's people, even though we're sat, you know, two metres apart, give and take, or whatever. The fact is, we are all here together under the sound of God's words. And so we're going to consider this, this idea of faith this morning as it's something that we have been uh, desperately, desperately needing to demonstrate over the past few weeks and months. That God will bring us through this time of uncertainty. I mean, look, let's strip it all away. How many times have we been through a time of uncertainty on earth? Be it a disease, be it whatever, war, be it whatever it might be. And how many times has God brought us through it? So let's make it absolutely clear at the start. This is a simple, short snippet of time in a God, in, in the world of a God who lives beyond time. Let's get that into its proper perspective this morning. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 7 of Luke. We're going to read 10 verses uh, together. They're going to be uh, up on screen. But of course, I encourage you to finish that, uh, to read uh, from your own, uh, your own Bibles. But it's uh, Luke chapter 7, and we'll read uh, 10 verses uh, together. So after he has said uh, all of these sayings in the hearing of the people, uh, he entered Capernaum. Uh, now a centurion had a, a servant who was sick, and at the point of death, uh, who was highly valued by him. When the, the centurion heard about Jesus, 
uh, he sent him to the elders of the Jews, asking them to come and heal his servant, or rather asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house of the centurion, the centurion, not far from the house rather, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man and sat under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servants well. So we are looking at this uh, incredible healing of Jesus as part of this bigger picture uh, of salvation. And we're, we're introduced to a, a, a centurion. He is a, a military man, a man who, who represents the very ideology of Rome. He would have been a, a, a man of, in a respected position. These, these men were responsible for, for the managing, training and, and leadership of their soldiers. They were seen as heroes for their bravery in battle. They were held in high esteem uh, by the Roman people. In the Roman world, acting on the order of a centurion was as good as acting on the order of the emperor himself. There was a very distinct chain of command between the emperor and the centurions. That message came down, it was not changed, and the order was given, and if that order was disobeyed, then there was execution. There was no judge, jury, trials, nothing. It was either accepted or rejected. And if it was rejected, then you were rejected. And that was the level in which the centurion's word was held. It was like it came down from the emperor himself. You see, this man uh, would have been in charge of keeping uh, the, the, the troops. He was responsible for law and order, uh, as well as uh, providing backup uh, for the tax collectors in this uh, fishing town and port. So this man, with all his influence, a man with, who had the backup of Rome, and all his, his soldiers, finds himself in a situation that leaves him powerless. Now, I have recently been through a situation that left me powerless because I have a five week old baby son at home. Well, I thought there might be a few more hours, but perhaps it was, <laughs> a, perhaps it was the masks that were in here that were hiding them. So, and gents, I don't know how many of you are fathers, but, but there is this moment when your wife goes in to have the baby, and that's it. You, you are there providing moral support and a few towels and things, and that's it. At that point, you are left completely and utterly powerless. If you're a Christian man, you pray, because you, I don't say this to be flippant, but you can't really do anything else. You've just got to let things happen. You are completely powerless. You have no say in that situation whatsoever. You just trust in the, the nurses and, and the midwives and the doctors and everybody else that might happen to be there. So if you've been through that, or any other experience like that where you have felt powerful, uh, powerless, you have an understanding of what this centurion is going through. But you see, unlike me and the fact that I was going through this situation with my wife, a lady who I've been married to for 12 years, who I love immensely, here is a man who is, who is going through that with, a, with his servant, with somebody who has worked with him for, uh, uh, for an incredibly long period of time. You see, this man was have meant a lot to that centurion. I very much doubt centurions trusted people enough uh, to let them into their homes and into their families at the drop of a hat. This man clearly has a standing in the centurion's life. Hence why he makes such an effort. But you see, this man's illness meant that he was clearly near death. This man's illness meant that he was clearly Near death. We're not, we're not told, but we could make a, an educated guess to say that the centurion would have consulted uh, physicians and, and the like, but to, but to no avail. You see, this centurion 
is already demonstrating faith. And he's demonstrating faith in many things. His training, his position, his soldiers, his empire, his emperor, his superior officers. All these things, and yet all these things, as powerful as they are, can do nothing to help his servant. They can do nothing to help his servant. You see, we have seen many people put faith in many things recently. Face coverings, hand sanitizer, staying two metres apart from people. In some cases, staying at home entirely, not leaving the house. All these things to try and spare us from an unknown illness. It's quite an easy link, isn't it, between what this servant was going through and what our life experience is right here as we sit here. We, we use these things to try and help us get through this period of uncertainty. And this is no different to what this centurion was doing. You see, this, this centurion represents all of us. Now, we might not have the position of a centurion. Some of us might have served in the military and have a little bit of an idea of what that might be like. But we all face death from time to time. Be it from a mystery illness, be it from something else entirely. And it's death that ultimately, forget pregnancy and labour and everything else that I talked about, it's death that renders us completely powerless. It was his servant's potentially innocent, in, imminent death that the centurion faced that left him completely powerless. His power, his influence, his authority counted for nothing in the face of death. And yet, listen to me very carefully with what I say now. Yet he hears of a man for whom death counted for nothing against his power, his influence, and his authority. Let's get Jesus right as we get into the meat of this passage. Let's get Jesus in his proper place. So as we face certain death, the question is, who do we turn to? When we face certain death, the question is, who do we turn to? Do you know how long I've been waiting to use that picture for the <laughs> Months. Months and not, I found it on the National Geographic Facebook page. It's fantastic, it's great. And it makes the point entirely. If you are that poor, unfortunate little starling, and that sparrow hawk is leaning over the top of you, with quite a menacing look in its eyes, things are not going to end well, are they? And yet here we are this morning, figuratively under the sparrow hawk. Because we don't know when death is going to come. We don't know when the end of it will come. Yet the question is, who do we turn to? So the centurion, he sends the elders of Israel to Jesus for help as he faced the death of his servant. They come up with an interesting way to try and persuade Jesus to help. Verse 4 uh, is on the screen. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. Now, on the surface of things, that's a, a quite a very nice, pleasant thing to say about someone, isn't it? You know, let's be honest. If Jesus, you could heal him, this man, you know, he's done good things, he's, he's a nice chap, he's helped us, and we build our synagogues, we, he's well respected. We, we, you know, we'd like you to go and do this for us. That's the way the world works, isn't it? You know, we all say we're all fair, and we don't have any bias or anything like that, and yet we'll always have people that will quite happily push, you know, up to a higher plain than anybody else. And yet here is this really interesting point. You see, the centurion gets it absolutely right. Is that he starts in the right way. That he comes to Jesus to the only man who can help his servant. But he does it in a way that is absolutely right. And we'll come on to that a little bit later on. But you see, this idea that the Jews have, have come to Jesus on the centurion's behalf, saying that he is, a, he is a good man, leads us on to an issue. If we're going to do anything, or rather ask Jesus to do anything for us, he will not do it if we come to him thinking that we are good and righteous. That's absolutely plain as day, as I see it in Scripture. Jesus will do nothing for us if we come to him thinking that we are good and righteous. Thinking that if we come before Jesus in that way, that we will receive anything we want from Christ. Let's, let's not be too hard, however, on, on people that think like that. There are 
millions of people out there that think like that. Our job, for those of us that are Christians, are to point them to the Scriptures and to show them that from what the Word of God says, the only way we come to Jesus is in humility. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, allow me for a moment to talk about football. Now, I have absolutely no place talking about football. I think it is the most dullest sport on earth, to be honest. And if they got rid of it tomorrow, I'd be a very happy man. When they announce that the Premier League starts again in a few weeks, there is an almighty groan that comes from the richest household because it bores me to tears. It really does. If you like football, you know, whatever. But anyway, so I have no right to talk about football, but there is a football manager, so I'm told, called Jose Mourinho. Now, he's done all sorts of exciting things, so I'm told. But he goes by this philosophy, and this is why I picked on this particular gentleman this morning. He goes by the philosophy that he is a good man, and so will God will bless him. He even had the audacity to say this. He, that being God, must think that I'm a really great guy. He must think that because otherwise he would not have given me so much. I have a great family. I work in a place where I was always dreamt of working. He has helped me, have, helped me out so much that he must have a very high opinion of me. And they give these idiots air time. <laughs> I, I said that out loud, didn't I? <laughs> but the point is, you could take that statement and flip it around very easily, move a few words very easily, and change it to what it should be. I think that my God is a really great God. I must think that, because otherwise he wouldn't have given me so much. I have a great family. I work in a place I've always dreamt of working. He has helped me out so much that I have an extremely high opinion of him. It's a very simple thing to do, to turn it around to give the glory back to God. But like I said, he is not the only person thinking that way. There are millions of people who think that because they do good, God will accept them. But let's be clear on this. The only way God will accept you is if you admit that you are not good, turn from what the Bible will sin, and repent. I mentioned earlier, or alluded to it earlier on, the fact that the centurion gets it right. The centurion sends friends to him saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. You see, he realises that it is Jesus that can help his servant. And he approaches him in humility. Let me ask you a very personal question. When was the last time you approached Jesus in humility? Have you ever approached Jesus in humility? Have you ever come to a point where you said, Lord, I realise that because of my sin, I realise that because of the errors that I have made in my life, so in the time that I have completely ignored what you have said, when I have decided that I know better than God himself, Lord, I am sorry for what I have done. I am sorry for the sin that is in my life. Lord, I realise that you died on the cross to save me. You see, it was the centurion who recognised who Jesus was. He recognised that there was salvation in Jesus. Salvation from death itself. You see, we've been introduced to all these characters within this story. Yet there's this underpinning thing that holds these all these stories up from Luke chapter 7 and 8. And when I say stories, I don't mean legends or fables, I just mean that in its accepted form. That Jesus offers salvation from death. You see, in this, this centurion, when filled with a sense of total unworthiness, when viewed against the overwhelming purity, greatness and worthiness of Christ. He says, I do not deserve. But he realises that he is unworthy. This centurion has reached a pinnacle moment because he's reached the starting point 
of a life with Christ. Have you recognised who Jesus is? Have you reached that point where you said, I do not deserve you? Have you seen what has happened for the past few months and weeks? We've had all these people in all their power, in all their authority, in all their pomp and circumstance, brought to their knees by something they can't even see. Have we reached that point? Have we reached that point where we say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. I do not deserve your grace. I do not deserve your mercy. But Lord, I need you. You see, that's what the centurion was saying when he said, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. The centurion, in the centurion we read in scripture, was a man who had authority. Yet there was something about the authority of Jesus that this man realised was special. He wasn't like other men. He didn't speak like other men, so the Bible says. He didn't do things like other men. And there was certainly no other man who could have healed his servant. You see, these Roman people were people that worshipped theogenies. They worshipped many gods. They had gods of practically every conceivable avenue that there is to have a god. And yet this man, this Gentile, is willing to forgo all that and trust in the one true God to resolve his problem. He's never seen Jesus. He's never laid eyes on Jesus, as to best of what it says in Scripture. But his faith is informed. His faith is based in evidence of what he's heard and what other people have told him. He trusts the sources that have told him these accounts of these incredible things that Jesus did. So as you look through Luke 7 and 8 over the next few weeks, you will hear more people who have had Jesus do and say things to them that has healed them, that has changed their life forever, that has shaped them into people who have gone on to share the word of God around the place. He recognises this centurion, just like these other people do, that Jesus has a unique authority. So the question is, as I close, what about you? Do you have faith like the centurion? And I don't mean in the fact that you trust in an emperor. I don't mean that you trust in the orders of your superiors. I mean that you do what he did. And he realised that he had to put his faith and trust in the salvation that Jesus offered. It's what I offer this morning. I don't come with anything else. I come with nothing more. And the salvation that Jesus offers. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you that as we've come together today, we've considered this incredible subject of faith. Lord, it's something that we do all the time, be it by design, be it by accident, or be it by a complete and utter subconscious decision. And yet, Lord, we realise that we need to put our faith and our trust in you. But Father, you are the God who deals with the uncertainty. You are the God who deals with death itself. And so, Father, as we come to you this morning, help us to be a people who are humble. Help us to be a people who humble ourselves to realise that we need to be right with our God. Father, we've prayed for our land, we've prayed for our nation. But, Lord, now we come to be slightly selfish and pray for ourselves. But Lord, that we would, but only in this, that we would be a people who would have a relationship with you. That, Father, we would demonstrate the faith of the centurion. That, Father, not in our rulers, not in our, in our powers, not in our authorities, and yet, Lord, we are reminded it's right to pray for these people. 
But ultimately, Lord, we will be a people who demonstrate the faith of the centurion in that he would trust Christ. He would trust Christ when he was at his weakest. That he would trust Christ in his uniqueness, in his authority, and in his authority over death itself. Father, thank you for that amazing verse at the end of our passage. That when the friends went home, they found the servant healed. Father, we thank you that we can be a people who can find healing from our sin. And as we come to the cross of Jesus, that's the only place that we can find healing. The only place that we can find a right relationship with God. So Lord, we come before you. Thank you for each of us that are gathered here uh, together. Thank you that we can come back together to be with the Lord's people. To come and to share the day together. And to share your word. And Lord, we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name.